My name is Joshua Nickerson. I am the Associate Program Director at the Oregon Health and Sciences University out in Portland, Oregon. And I am presenting to you the result of a study we performed over the course of the last year, uh, looking at the correlation between the ACGME case logs and the results of the AVR core exam pass rate for radiology residents. With regard to disclosures, I have no financial disclosures to make relevant other than this study was funded by the Jerome Arndt grant from the Association of Program Directors in Radiology, uh, which did allow us to uh, get some of the data and uh, get some statistical support for uh, putting this project together. So in way of background, I think most of you are going to be well aware of most of these facts, but in 2008, the ABR got rid of the oral boards. Uh, I was one of the last classes back in the day to take the oral boards, and since that time, uh, we have now moved to much more computer-based testing with respect to the core exam um, and certifying exams. One of the real motivations behind this was to try to eliminate the board's frenzy uh, that was currently being seen during much of the fourth year of radiology residency, when uh, fourth year residents would primarily disappear from the clinical services, sometimes for months at a time, up to six months reported, in some cases uh, from clinical duties leading up to the exam. And the idea was that uh, now these uh, most well-trained and most experienced residents would now be uh, providing more clinical care up till the end of their training. But it was anticipated that, of course, some of that shift uh, would occur going back to the PGY4 year prior to the core examination. In anticipation of that reality, the APDR in 2012 published a uh, white paper advocating, advocating full-time participation in clinical duties the entire four years with no time off. Obviously, allowances were to be made for some call-free months leading up to the exam, um, but there was to be no uh, more time completely away from clinical services for months leading up to the core test. I think this uh, statement from that white paper sort of encapsulates what the APDR was aiming for. During residency, viewing, interpreting, and reporting images at the workstation under the supervision of radiology educators will be the best way to learn clinically relevant radiology. And this echoes what I think a lot of us in the educational world feel has been the mantra for many years, that the best way to learn radiology is to show up every day and to read as many cases as you can get your hands on. And by the end of four years, hopefully you will have seen the majority of entities that you may run across in clinical practice uh, during the course of your clinical work. And uh, so that has been what's advocated by program directors for many, many years. So the core exam was first administered following that white paper in 2013, and the APDR, as well as a cubed CR squared, the Organization of Chief Residents in Radiology, uh, performed several surveys in the years following that time, asking questions about the perceived shift in uh, study time, in clinical responsibility as a result of the switch to the core exam. And in 2013 and 2014, greater than 40% of programs were removing residents from clinical duties prior to the examination um, at the end of the year, as was expected. Another piece of background information is that of the case logs. So since 2007-2008 academic year, the ACGME has mandated collection of case log data from residency programs. And this has been a challenge for a lot of us uh, in the program director world, because you would think it would be very easy to get at these numbers, simply how many of any particular code uh, has a resident read over the course of their training thus far. But because of the challenges in getting that information from various risk systems, from PACs, from billing data, whether or not a resident's name remains attached to a study they looked at on call overnight or that was assumed by a fellow the next day, um, is actually quite variable and getting at this data is challenging. So. Uh, inherent in looking at that data is the understanding that there are quite variable methods by which institutions collect those numbers, um, and there is likely to be some degree of interinstitutional variability uh, in those numbers. But we still thought it was worth it. So these are the codes currently uh, that are collected and required to be submitted to the ACGME for every resident at the end of training. As you can see, it's a cross section of studies from uh, a variety of modalities, but it's certainly not comprehensive, um, but it does include 
uh, at least something from most of the modalities and most of the sections that our trainees uh, participate in. So why did we want to do this study? Well, I think the theory is, is it true that in fact, looking at a lot of studies over the course of your four years of training is the best way to prepare for the core examination. That certainly has been the mantra of the ABR and of the APDR. Uh, but I think there's this perception, certainly among residents and in many cases among faculty as well, that that may not actually be true. That in fact, it is necessary to take time away from clinical services to study books or to do practice question banks or what have you um, to perform well in the core examination. Well, over the course of the entire country, if we could have a big enough data set, we should be able to look at that and see if it's true. We should be able to see those who read more studies, do they perform better on the core exam? And you might argue that, well, the couple of months leading up to the core exam is a fairly small period of time over the course of three years. But if you have a big enough data set, we should be able to see a trend. So that's what we set out to look at. So it's important to note that this obviously required cooperation between the ACGME, RRC, and the ABR because we had to collect all of this data. And I want to take a minute at this point to talk about that. So you, probably, you may have noticed um, on my title slide that there were a couple of collaborators uh, that were attached to these organizations. So Jim Anderson, um, who is my colleague at OHSU, at the time of this study was also the chair of the radiology RRC and uh, was very closely uh, and is still very closely associated with the ACGME. And Dr. Valerie Jackson uh, at the time was the president of the ABR. And one of the uh, critiques that this study has received since it was published in Academic Radiology uh, following submission to this meeting was that these uh, clearly bias the results of this study. I just want to be very clear that neither of those folks uh, were involved in the analysis of the data. The ACGME and the ABR very seriously take uh, the um, uh, confidentiality of the data that they have. And so it actually took months of working back and forth between those two organizations, between their legal counsels, to find a way to anonymize this data so that it could be analyzed by a third party, namely me, um, without there being any kind of breach of confidentiality. Fortunately, Dr. Jackson also is an ex officio member of the uh, RRC, and so she was a party that would have access to this data under normal circumstances, regardless of the situation. So what we did was she got the data from the ACGME. She then got the pass-fail data for one year's cohort of residents from the ABR and personally collated those and anonymized them so that each resident was now only represented by a numerical code and the residency programs were uh, represented by alpha codes. And then these were put together in a way that was completely anonymized and only then was that data transmitted to me. Now, that being said, that was the last time that Dr. Jackson or Dr. Anderson touched the data or saw any part of this project until the final manuscript was completed and sent to them for review and editing. And very little review and editing, I mean very little editing in any case, uh, occurred. So this idea that somehow because Dr. Jackson was involved invalidates the data, I, I, I don't believe that is true. Uh, she did play a crucial part in getting the data, um, but uh, there was no conspiracy th uh, on the part of the ABR to try to uh, show this one way or the other. I think she and others were genuinely interested in whether or not this theory would be true. So. All of that being said, what we then did was try to address the variability in how programs collect the ACGME case logs. Well, fortunately, we have enough programs and we have enough residents in many of these programs that we were able to normalize across the programs um, for variability within each program on how this data is collected. So, for example, if you have program A with 10 residents who are able to collect data from the time they are on nights versus program B, uh, who perhaps don't, you can normalize the two uh, by looking at what is the high end of each program and then bringing that to a standard value. And then you're able to compare that uh, looking at logistic regression models to see whether or not uh, there is a correlation. There were two programs that were excluded uh, because there were zero case log entries. Um, and we assumed that 
that was an error on the part of the programs, which uh, certainly the ACGME probably looked into afterwards. But as that would have significantly uh, biased our data, we did exclude two programs for that reason. And there was one other program where their values they reported on the case logs were uh, literally three times the average. They were a massive outlier um, along the uh, right aspect of the curve. And so we did choose to exclude that as well. We used a bivariate linear model, um, which assumes a linear relationship between case, uh, cases read and performance on the core exam. And then we also looked at this with a quadratic model that see, to see if there was perhaps a nonlinear relationship. So uh, just a few results here. So these are the uh, total radiology residency reads. And we did not break it down by type of exam. I think uh, that would have significantly decreased our sample size. And you could certainly argue that there may be specific CPT codes that are more closely correlated with performance on the exam. I think that would be a really interesting question to look at um, were we to acquire several more years worth of data to increase our sample size. But for this initial study, we chose to simply look at the total number of radiology studies uh, read. And then you can see the number of programs that, uh, or the number of residents rather, uh, in each one of those columns. So most of the residents are somewhere between the five and 10,000. Uh, exams over the course of their training. For the year that we were looking at, this was the pass-fail rate. So you can see 87% um, of the residents passed the core exam. This is first-time test takers, by the way, uh, and 13% failed. We did not choose to uh, consider conditioning as a separate category. In this case, we simply put that into fail as a non-pass result. So this is the most important uh, graph to consider when you look at the correlation between these two metrics. The blue line is the uh, probability, and the uh, light blue shaded area behind the line is the um, these uh, confidence intervals. So as you can see, uh, it looks like up to a certain point, the idea that increasing the number of studies one reads does in fact increase your probability of passing up to an inflection point of what turns out to be around 11,000 exams. And as you'll note, because the sample size is highest at those numbers, the confidence interval is most narrow uh, near the apex of that curve. The interesting thing we saw, and this is perhaps, um, perhaps understandable, is that beyond that inflection point, we actually start to see a decrease in the chances of passing the core exam. And we'll talk a little bit about why that may or may not be but I also would like to point out that because the sample size gets significantly smaller as you head out beyond 15,000 exams, the confidence intervals become very wide. But nevertheless, this, uh, this seemed like quite an interesting result. There's that inflection point around 11,000. So there, this has been looked at um, not a lot, but there was one a single center retrospective study done in 2019 uh, and published. And this distribution curve is actually quite similar to what that single institution found uh, over the course of multiple years uh, with their residents. It does suggest that there is a positive correlation, as I said, um, and beyond that, perhaps service obligations begin to outweigh the educational value. So I think, you know, if you wanted to interpret this as who is this, who is this data good for? Well, it's actually good for, for everybody. I think the, um, the program directors and the ABR are likely gratified to see that, yes, indeed, um, if you read more studies up to a certain point, you are likely to do better on the examination. But I think trainees also should take uh, comfort in the fact that beyond a certain point, it is likely that when service obligations begin to outweigh uh, emphasis on education, performance will suffer. So if a resident is simply uh, asked to read a ton of plain films every day and uh, has very little time to attend educational conferences, or, um, or get any teaching, uh, eventually that is also going to negatively impact their chances of passing a core exam. Certainly there are confounders uh, of this study. We did have to use this statistical correlation, as I've mentioned, for the variability in case log uh, data, and that is, at least at this time, likely something that we were unable to, would be unable to avoid, um, given the variability in how this data is collected. There are also a lot of individual factors which may contribute to both of these things. And I think that's a, that's a more difficult thing to pin down, but I think all of us uh, who are involved in resident education uh, have seen trainees who excel in 
both their clinical duties and on written exams, and that may have little to do with the amount of time they spend, but rather to do with individual factors such as personal motivation, time management, um, you know, what have you. And so uh, that is an intangible that is not necessarily captured by looking at whether or not someone has time away from a clinical service. Certainly there are uh, trainees that are just more motivated to read a greater number of studies every day and they may be more motivated to go home and study and read more chapters when they get home in the evening. Uh, and such, they will do well on the core exam, regardless of, of whether or not they have time off. And then there, this is a single cohort of data. So originally I had hoped to look at maybe three or four years, um, but the ABR and the ACGME were hesitant to uh, want to give out more than one year's worth of anonymized data uh, even given all the machinations that were gone through to make sure that, that uh, confidentiality was maintained. Also, uh, you know, it was a lot of hand work uh, by Dr. Jackson to have to collate all that data before it was passed along to me. But I think this is something that I would be really interested in looking at down, uh, down the line if we can get a few more years worth of data to see if we can narrow those confidence intervals and be more definitive about where that inflection point is. Um, and what is the effect, uh, both negative and positive, um, of having read more exams during the course of training. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this was a really interesting project to do. It uh, in some ways confirmed the theories that I think a lot of program directors have about how training should occur, uh, but I think it also um, opened our eyes to the potential detriments of, of too much emphasis on clinical duties. And uh, I think finding that sweet spot is certainly the balance that all program directors shoot for. But uh, hopefully down the road, we will be able to look at more data and figure out um, exactly where that point might be. And uh, our training can evolve as a result of that. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me, uh, email me um, at OHSU. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hello, I'm Gretchen Foltz. I'm the program director for the IR residency at Washington University in St. Louis. I also serve as the MOC committee chair for the Society of Interventional Radiology. And it's in this capacity that I've been involved in leadership meetings with the ABR and SIR where we've discussed preparing residents for the IRDR certifying exam. The outline of this talk is to address whether there is an issue with how we're preparing residents for this exam to outline some ways as to how we got here and to provide some thoughts on how we can adjust course. So what is the issue? In 2013, the ABR changed to the core exam and written certifying exam format. While this isn't news to anybody listening to this webinar, in 2016, it did lead us to a group of examinees who is taking an IR oral exam for the first time who had not previously taken a DR certifying oral exam. And this led to a group of examinees who didn't understand the gamesmanship of how to take an oral exam. We didn't help ourselves any because in 2017, the ABR changed the oral exam format just slightly, but that slight change led to some additional confusion from the examinees as to what they needed to do and demonstrate in order to fully pass that oral exam. The examinee performance was discussed by the ABR and SIR leadership at multiple meetings over the 2018 and 2019 time course. And there were concerns raised regarding how examinees were performing during the oral exam <clears throat> raised by the ABR. The SIR leadership requested feedback from the ABR with some specifics that they could um, use to address these concerns. And while the ABR did provide some feedback, some feedback, it was a bit sanitized and a little bit generic, which is why their specific feedback is grayed out here. But overall, the summary of that feedback basically came down to three things. That examinees were not comfortable with or didn't understand the format of the oral exam that examinees were not focusing on the clinical management of the patients, which was felt to be a key part that they needed to demonstrate uh, to be a competent physician in the, the domain of IR, and that examinees were not prepared for the complete depth and breadth of cases considered to be something all certified DR IR physicians should be familiar with according to the ABR. 
So how did we get to a place where there were significant concerns over how examinees were performing on the oral exam compared to their historic counterparts who had the benefit of taking a DR oral certifying exam? And it all kind of centers around this 2013 mark where the ABR decided to change their exam format as we've discussed before. In addition to this, change in the exam format. It was around this time that the American Board of Medical Specialties approved IR as a primary medical specialty. And in the few years after that, many programs across the country were transitioning and figuring out how they were going to transition to a new IRDR residency pathway. This uh, transition provided um, significant angst, and we'll get into that a little bit more later, but it was then in 2015, 2016 that we had the first match for the integrated IR residents. 2013 also was the year that the ACGME introduced the Milestones Project, and this launching led to slight changes in the focus on how we evaluate residents. So is these three big events, the change in the ABR testing, the ACGME Milestones Project, and the creation of the new IRDR certificate, which happened relatively um, simultaneously, that led to many changes in how we are educating our residents, which might explain why there's this significant difference in examinee performance on the oral exam. So we know that there were changes that with the change in the ABR testing, programs did respond in changing how they were preparing residents for the exam. When you look at the chief resident survey in 2012, so that survey uh, during the last year of the oral exam, right before the transition to the core exam, there were the vast majority of programs who provided some sort of oral board exam, whether in the form of an internal board review or allowing time off service to attend an external board review to prepare residents to take this sort of exam. With Looking forward to this change, it was also noted on this survey that many programs were planning to adapt their teaching methods to reflect the multiple choice format of the new core exam. When you look at the chief resident survey for the years just after the implementation of the new exam, while there were many programs that were still offering an internal board review that had a case-based format, the focus of that case-based format was focusing on how to answer multiple choice questions as opposed to how to discuss those cases in an oral board type format. It was also noted that there was a rapid integration of electronic educational tools such as RAD Primer that were tailored to the multiple choice format of the ABR exam. Well, for many years, the residents were evaluated based on the six core competencies um, that the ACGME set out. It was in 2013 that the Milestones Project was launched, which was focused on helping to guide curriculum and develop assessment tools for specific evaluation of these core competencies. This led to a trend toward objective assessment tools for these competencies. And over the years uh, that followed, there's been intense focus on tools like RAD exam uh, to provide some sort of objective assessment uh, for residents to fill one of these uh, core competencies. It's this shift to electronic based uh, tools that the concern was raised that many of the uh, educational opportunities that we had for our residents are being converted at least somewhat to a computer-based or an electronic format, um, which leaves less time for a hot seat or um, oral type case conference where uh, residents have a, a structured uh, format by which they're taking cases which would better prepare them for an oral type exam. The creation of the new IRDR certificate had many ups and downs with programs navigating the implementation of this new training pathway. The annual survey of the, APDI, of the APDR members at this time uh, indicated that a majority of people thought that the implementation of this new IRDR pathway would negatively affect the DR residency with 
loss of DR training positions, confusion over um, administrative and educational leadership between these two programs, as well as concern that there was going to be significant crossover with residents jumping back and forth between the IR and the DR training pathways as they change their mind with what they want to do. Additionally, it was thought by multiple program directors that there was a lack of enthusiasm by the IR faculty for this new training pathway with only 42% of respondents saying that they had enthusiastic report. Uh, support from their IR faculty. It was all these things together that led to much um, angst and nervousness as we set forth in um, adapting these training pathways to accommodate both of these primary specialties. And to the AUR's credit, there were multiple sessions during uh, the programs over multiple years where different uh, aspects of this implementation were addressed. Anybody who sat through any of these sessions knows that the question and answer portion of, of these sessions were definitely filled with heated debate from people on, on both sides of, of uh, the aisle uh, voicing concern over um, how these new programs were going to be alt uh, implemented. Ultimately, um, the slow ramp up of the implementation may have left a gap where those trainees who did go through on the traditional DR uh, residency and then fellowship pathway, but were forced into the new exam paradigm of the new IRDR training pathway were left in a little bit of a gap where they had the all of the training from the DR uh, side of things, which was more focused on uh, written um, assessments, whereas there was maybe a gap in fulfilling uh, the educational for how to take an oral exam. Uh, that was a remnant uh, that the, the IR side of things wanted to maintain. So what do we do now? Let's start by looking back. When the DR certification had an oral component, there was some intense look at how to best prepare residents for an oral exam. And in 2005, Cannon wrote a, a very nice article on how to structure a mock radiology oral exam to better prepare residents for that type of exam structure. It was noted that residents were systematically trained to perform the tasks required of a resident and what a radiologist would have in practice, but they were not systematically trained to handle the pressure of performing for a high stakes exam like the oral exam at the ABR. And so a specific um, educational program formatting formatted onto how to take that exam was needed. It was also noted that the most appropriate preparation for an oral exam is for trainees to practice discussing cases out loud. And so that became the format for a lot of hot seats um, and then these mock oral exams. And this is the component that with the transition to um, multiple choice and um, electronic based evaluations for residents, they are missing out on this practice of discussing cases out loud in a structured format, um, which may be hindering them when they're taking uh, the oral exam. So that was then, this is now, now all we're left with is IR examinees who are meant to take this oral exam and the DR um, residents are left with written certifying exams. However, Strickland et al. Um, decided to see if there was still a role for a mock exam for all trainees. The experience of that program was shown that um, residents taking cases with little or no guidance was very reflective of what radiologists do in clinical practice and was very reflective of what their knowledge base was at the time and it also taught residents quote how to take a case. It also fostered a cohesive style of communication that residents could use and fall back on when describing cases so that everybody was on the same page um, with how the case was progressing and what was being talked about. 
when the uh, faculty and residents were surveyed afterwards. 100% of the faculty had a positive impression of retaining a mock oral board, citing that it was very useful in assessing strengths and weaknesses of trainees, and it was a good reflection of what the resident fund of knowledge was. Whereas when the residents <coughs> were asked what they thought, only 50% only 50% had a positive uh, view of the experience with comments ranging from uh, the exam being very helpful to identify areas for improvement um, on one end to it being uh, futile given the new computerized format of the core and certifying exam. It's noted at many training programs that there are residents who cite similar objections to hot seat and other case-based type conferences and why there is some pushback with those types of conferences uh, being held. Um, those types of conferences can be pretty anxiety provoking and if you um, can't make the case that it's good for them because of an oral exam that they have to take later, um, it can be hard to get residents to buy into why those types um, of case conferences really are going to be beneficial to them uh, in their practice. However, whether or not you believe it's a benefit for the trainee on the DR side, I think we can all agree that it would be beneficial for the trainee on the IR side. And regardless of your trainee, I think we can all um, agree that it would be of benefit to a program in multiple ways, both Canon and Strickland. So people who did papers on both sides of that training paradigm did cite that, you know, hot seat or an oral based conferences can be an instrument for quality improvement for the resident and educational program. It can guide curricular development by revealing systemic weaknesses in the residency knowledge. Um, it can identify struggling residents in need of remediation and um, overall simulation or objective structured clinical exam, which is basically what a mock oral exam is or what a hot seat conference is, is listed as a possible assessment tool under all six competencies in the ACGME um, CCC guidelines. Most specifically though, I think you could make the argument that um, they are specifically well suited to address patient care, medical knowledge, and interpersonal and communication skill components of those six competencies. So where does this leave us? I think this leaves us with knowing that we have to implement some sort of structured oral um, board review for those residents taking the oral exam. Historically, the oral exam um, was going to be a little over a year after uh, fellows had ended their training at their residency program. With this new IR residency pathway, the certifying written and oral exam timeline has moved up significantly so that IR residents are going to end their training in June and they will sit in that October of that same year for their IR DR certifying exam, both the written and oral components. So there are just a couple of months in between when they're going to end their residency and when they're going to be sitting for this um, oral boards. And when you look at that back at that paper that uh, Cannon put out in 2005, 63% of the residents said that the sweet spot for when to do um, a mock board or oral exam preparation was within the three to four months prior to the exam, which is hitting us right at the sweet spot at the end of their residency. About 37% thought that two months prior was adequate but that closer than two months was not going to be adequate to address any deficiencies if they were noted in the preparation and that more than four months prior would not have as great of an emotional impact in terms of how you're going to prepare and gear up for that exam um, as opposed to really hitting it at that three to four mark. So with the shift in how the ABR is um, providing the timing for the written and oral exam, um, it lines up nicely with us providing some sort of opportunity for the trainees to have an, an oral exam prep towards the end of their training in their residency program. Whether or not you actually decide to do a mock board exam, I think 
um, it behooves us all to teach residents how to approach a case. To pause for a second and think to yourself several questions where then you can address image interpretation, you can address the periprocedural management of patients, and you can address the competency in image guided procedures. And it's these three components that residents need to hit on in cases to demonstrate competency in the domain of interventional radiology. So tips for studying, I think in general, we have to get residents used to saying things out loud. They're not gonna be able to have their mind function in the same way that they would for a multiple choice exam um, and be able to perform adequately on an oral exam with that same thought process. So being able to get in the habit of saying what your findings are and what your thought process is and how you're gonna address those cases out loud is a very different skill set and definitely needs to be practiced. Residents need to be able to recognize disease processes, critical findings, the ant minis from a single image as opposed to um, scrolling through decks. While there are some image decks that they can scroll through, some of the cases are gonna be based on a single image. We should make sure that our residents know what the institutional standards are or what societal standards and protocols are because those are going to be what is hit hard um, during that oral exam and that they need to acknowledge that there are several ways to approach a case and that their ideal or preferred way or what the way they were taught in their program is not going to be the only way that you can approach a case. And so being familiar with multiple ways to approach a case is going to uh, benefit them on exam day. And they should also be familiar with the clinical management and follow up of all the disease processes and not just the intervention of uh, the issue that a patient's being referred to them for. So with that, Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Molly Meek, and I am the IR Program Director at the University of Arkansas in Little Rock. I'm also the president of the APDIR. My email is down here if you would like to contact me regarding any questions about APDIR or the uh, match results that I'm going to show you today. So these are the general match numbers obtained from ARIS and the NRMP for 2019 and 2020 for the independent IR match. You'll remember that the independent program is the program that is more classically like the fellowship and occurs at the end of DR training. I'll give you just a second to look over these numbers. The first thing you'll notice is that there's a difference in the number of positions between 2019 and 2020. There were 22 fewer positions in the match this year. This is explained by the number of ESIR and non-ESIR candidates that matched last year. So in 2019 of the 172 candidates, 39 of those were non-ESIR, which means that they will do the full two-year independent training. And thus this decreases then the number of positions available in 2020. The next thing you'll notice is the difference between the number of applicants and the number of candidates registered with the NRMP. The first thing is that in general, the number of applicants decreased by about 22, 32 candidates, actually 32 candidates um, between 2019 and 2020. And the number of applicants is the number of people that registered in ARIS. And then the number NRMP, that's the number of candidates that actually registered with the NRMP. So why there is a difference between the number that registered in ARIS and the number in that participated in the match is likely due to candidates changing their mind or perhaps applying to multiple specialties, or those could be candidates that applied in ARIS and then did not get any interviews so that they then did not apply to be in the match. Of the candidates that matched, this is the breakdown of their medical education, as is been true throughout the history of the IR program, the majority of them are MDs, and then the rest is sort of equally broken down between the other three groups. This is pretty standard across the years. 
So there are 35 trainees that went unmatched. That's the difference between the number that participated in the match and the number that actually matched on match day. So and that has been steady over the past few years. As IR rises and lowers in popularity, sometimes we have more candidates and we have a higher number of unmatched trainees. And uh, sometimes IR is less popular and we have fewer candidates that want to match. But in general, we've had multiple years where there have been 30, even up to 40 candidates that don't match in a season. Three of those 35 people matched into another specialty, and then unfortunately we don't know the details of what happened to the other 32. I want to give a big thank you to Jen Gabot and Joy Cornall, who are SIR staff. They have called all of the programs and sent out surveys to try to get us more details about what happens to unfilled positions and what who exactly matches where and whether they're ESIR or non-ESIR. So thank you, ladies, for all of your work on that. There are nine unfilled positions. That's the difference between the number of positions registered by programs in the match and the number of candidates actually matched. Two of these are a quota error. So there were not actually 150 positions. There were really only 148. Seven positions then went unfilled and four positions filled after the match. So of the 141 people that matched on match day, we have data on 89 of those candidates and programs. We are hoping to get uh, phone calls back from the programs that we haven't been able to get information from. 13 were non-ESIR and 76 were ESIR. And again, these numbers will impact the number of positions available in 2021. And we're hoping that this will reach a more balanced state as we continue this process over the next few years. Thank you for your attention to the details of the independent match. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or reach out to Joy or Jen at the SIR. Hello, my name is Christopher Ho. I am the program director of the Diagnostic Radiology Program, Radiology Program, and Associate Program Director of the Interventional Radiology Program here at Emory University. First, I want to say thank you to the AUR and APDIR for allowing me to give this talk virtually today, and thank you for tuning in. I hope I can clarify some things about the ESIR program and how you can enable success for your residents with the ESIR designation. I have no relevant financial disclosures. So for this talk, I'll first give an overview of the ESIR program, and then I'll give a timeline of what to expect for your ESIR residents in terms of when to apply for the designation and also applying for the independent residency. We'll spend the bulk of the time talking about oversight of the resident procedure experience as this is a big part of the ESIR designation and making sure your residents reach the 500 procedure logs. And then next we'll talk about mentorship and ability to apply for the independent residency and how you can help your resident successfully match. And then finally, I'll talk about some documentation that's required of the program directors in order to ensure success for your ESIR resident and graduating on time. There are currently 159 diagnostic radiology programs with the ESIR designation. And of course, there are requirements for the ESIR program. ACG requires 11 four-week rotations, eight of which have to be in interventional radiology and three in interventional radiology-related areas. The residents are also required to complete one continuous four-week ICU rotation. And importantly, they also have to log 500 procedures during their time in residency. It's also important to note that you shouldn't forget that the residents are still diagnostic radiology residents, even though they have the ESIR designation. So they have to maintain and meet all the milestone requirements for graduation. So let's talk a little bit about the timeline of what your ESIR residents can expect during residency, as it can be a little bit confusing. So this is just a sample timeline of what your residents can expect during their four years in the diagnostic radiology program with the ESIR designation. And this is just an example of what we do at our institution, so this can be flexible. We have at least one 
four-week IR rotation in each of the first three years of the residency. And the residents that do receive the ESIR designation then complete their ESIR year and program requirements during their fourth year. Now, in terms of when the residents should apply for the ESIR program can be variable. Um, it can be done anywhere in the second or third year as there's no hard and fast rule of when it needs to be done. Us, for example, we have our residents apply for the ESIR program in between their second and third year, and we give them the designation early on in their third year as that allows the residents then to apply for the independent residency with the ESIR designation. Here, you'll see a sample schedule of the fourth year for our ESIR residents. Again, there are nine interventional radiology or interventional radiology related rotations including the ICU month in our schedule and we do allow time for electives and nuclear medicine and mammography requirements per ABR graduation requirements. So let's talk about procedural oversight now as this is a large part of the ESIR program. As you know residents have to maintain a patient procedure log with a minimum of 500 cases. And what counts towards this patient procedure log? Well, um, according, this is pulled straight from the ACGME website. Uh, any interventional radiology procedure obviously counts toward this encounter log. Any interventional radiology related procedure also counts toward this log. For example, if your resident is rotating through neurointerventional radiology or doing procedures on abdominal imaging or cardiothoracic imaging, these procedures would count towards that patient procedure encounter log. It's important to note though that the resident does have to be the first operator for these procedures, so residents, multiple residents cannot share these procedures. Additionally, if you have an outpatient clinic and your resident is participating and doing initial outpatient evaluations and management visits, this does count towards that procedure encounter log as well. Now, what's important to remember here, though, is that this is separate from the ACGME case logs. Your ESIR residents are still diagnostic radiology residents, so they still have to maintain and meet the ACGME minimum case logs in addition to maintaining their patient procedure and counter logs. So how can your resident maintain these patient and counter logs? There are many different ways that the residents can maintain the logs. They can do it the old-fashioned way and write down their cases in a notebook or on a password protected spreadsheet. Uh, I'd recommend against the notebook as these things can get easily get lost and if there is protected patient information in there, uh, there becomes many privacy issues. Additionally, this can be also driven from the program side. Um, there are many applications such as high IQ, um, electronic medical records, or third-party applications that help track and maintain the patient encounter logs. It really depends what best suits your program. Uh, we, for example, have our IT division develop a database where that is searchable where our residents can pull up the procedure logs and maintain them. And this is kind of hot off the press, um, just announced um, from SIR, but uh, starting July 1st, 2020, they have developed an IR residency training tracker, and this will be mandatory for all integrated interventional radiology residents and programs. This has then standardized the format of how residents log their procedures and information related to the procedures. Um, it's not required of DR programs and ESIR residents, comma, however, it is, Jesus, comma. So how can we help our residents maintain the procedure encounter logs? Uh, residents can do it really the good old fashioned way and write down their cases in a notebook um, or their own personal spreadsheet that's hopefully password protected. Um, but I would advise against this as there are security risks involved and these notebooks are easily misplaced or lost and it would become very worrisome, especially if there was uh, patient information within the notebook. Um, this can also be program driven. There are many applications that allow um, searchable databases for procedure logs, including high IQ, electronic medical records, or third party applications. Uh, we, for example, have our informatics team run queries based on CPT codes for our residents semi-annually to get their procedural numbers. Uh, and kind of hot off the press here, um, just announced from SIR, the IR residency training tracker has been developed and starting July 1st, 2020, all integrated interventional radiology programs will be required for their interventional radiology residents to maintain this training tracker. What this has done is it provides a standardized format for the residents to maintain their procedure logs and so that the format is standardized across all different programs. It has not been required that our diagnostic radiology or ESIR residents use this. However, they do recommend that um, diagnostic radiology and ESIR residents adopt this as it would help uh, 
ease the creation of the patient encounter log and maintenance of it as well. So now that we have the logistics of the program down, let's talk about how we can be better mentors for our residents who are applying for the independent interventional radiology residency after having received that ESIR designation. So first and foremost, they have to be accepted into your home ESIR program. And this is where the timing of the acceptance becomes important. If they're accepted too late in the third year, you don't want to interfere with their ability to apply as an ESIR applicant via ERAS in the fall of their third year. So that's why we as a program assign the ESIR designation to our residents early in their third year. Um, there are some components to the application that are a little bit unique. Uh, so it's good to inform your residents about this. In the resident's personal statement, um, beyond discussing their interest in interventional radiology, they do have to state specifically what their ESIR status is, what the procedure mix is at their institution, and what IR-related rotations they will rotate through during their ESIR year. So I put together a little timeline of what to expect during your third year for your diagnostic radiology residents that are applying to the IR independent residency programs. Around November of their third year, applications open and uh, residents are encouraged to submit their applications as soon as they can. Programs begin reviewing the applications in December and interviews happen throughout the winter time through early spring. And then finally, hopefully everything goes well and we have a successful match in June of the third year prior to the official start of their ESIR fourth year. So let's talk a little bit about what is required from the program director standpoint in terms of documentation to help your residents apply for the independent interventional radiology residency and after they graduate. Residents who are applying for independent interventional radiology residency are required to have at least one letter of recommendation from the program director and they are required to use the standard standardized letter of recommendation form which you'll see here on the next page. So there are really four parts to this form. There is the applicant program director data. There is the actual letter of recommendation. Uh, you do have to upload a block diagram for your ESIR residents, uh, and you do have to have an attestation that the resident is participating in ESIR and will graduate by the projected date. So again, this is just reviewing the kind of required components of the standardized letter of recommendation. And in the actual letter of recommendation, portion, I do have some verbiage that I enter uh, on my on my own uh, that states that yes, this resident is part of our ESIR program, and I also state how many rotations in interventional radiology they have completed thus far, and also give um, projected graduation date and uh, procedural quota data. Again, this is not required, but I think that just, just helps reaffirm that the resident is participating in ESIR and is meeting the requirements uh, that would be expected prior to graduation. So after all this is said and done, hopefully your resident has matched and they graduate. Um, there's a couple more things that are required of you prior to the resident starting at their independent interventional radiology residency. Uh, per the ACGME, prior to graduation, we do have to provide written verification of the completion of the 500 patient encounters and also provide the patient procedure encounter logs to the independent interventional radiology program. So that brings us to near the end of the talk. I want to thank everyone for your time, but just a couple of things to uh, remember. Uh, really becomes important to think about the timeline of when you're accepting your ESIR applicants, because this will help them determine uh, when they're applying for their independent interventional radiology residency spots, and also uh, help them tailor their schedule and perhaps their research interests towards interventional radiology. Another big part of uh, ensuring success for your ESIR residents is ensuring that they maintain appropriate documentation and logging of procedures. And uh, we've talked about how, uh, what is included in this uh, patient encounter procedure log and how we can best document it, um, whether it be electronically or through other means. Uh, and then finally, as program director, well, we want to make sure that you're able to mentor your ESIR residents and get them to their dream independent residency programs. So there is required documentation from us in terms of the standardized letter of recommendation and also documenting completion of the requirements prior to graduation. I do want to say thank you at this, as this is the end of the talk. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or direct message me on Twitter. And thank you for your time. And I hope this helps you figure a game plan to help your ESIR residents find success and match into their dream program. Thank you.